Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the SH Kelkar and Company Limited Q1 FI23 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anup Pujari from CDR India. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on SHK Care and Company Limited's Q1 FY23 earnings conference call. We have with us Mr. Kedar Vaje, Old Time Director and Group CEO, and Mr. Rohit Saraghi, EVP and Group CFO of the company. We will begin the call with opening remarks from the management, following which we will have the forum open for a question and answer session. Before we start, I would like to point out that some statements made in today's call will be forward-looking in nature, and a disclaimer to this effect has been included in the earnings presentation shared with you earlier. I would now like to invite Mr. Kedar Vaze to make his opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> and thank you for joining us on our quarter one FI23 earnings call. We will discuss the operating and financial performance for the quarter and give some idea about how the business is doing. I hope you had all the opportunity to go through the results and we, we will get into the details of the operational and financial performance hearing. <clears throat> we have reported a resilient <clears throat> performance during the quarter despite a challenging macroeconomic due to the inflation pressures. While we saw some operating constraints during the period, our client engagements and wins across the markets remained stable. I'm happy to share that we have successfully and efficiently integrated our recent acquisitions, namely Holland Aromatics and New Taste Food, into our business model during the quarter. Overall, on a consolidated basis, our total income stood at rupees 415 crores, higher by 15.7% year on year, and on a like-to-like -like basis, our revenues, excluding the acquisitions, at constant currency grew by 7.5% year-on-year. Emerging market sales in the quarter stood at rupees 319 crores, registering an organic growth of 12% year-on-year. Acquired businesses' delivery also remained robust, led by improved demand and volume of take in the European markets. On a like-to-like -like basis, our European core business grew by 8% year-on-year. During the quarter, we continue to witness cost pressures on account of inflation in raw materials. Despite these challenges, we have maintained our gross margins at 39%. This was made possible through combination of price increases, inventory management, and somewhat uh, flattening and easing of inflationary pressures in the market. Overall, our EBITDA stood in the quarter at 55.1 crores, with margins at 13.4%. Cash profits in the quarter stood at Rs. 42.1 crore, as against cash profit of Rs. 34.1 crore in quarter 1 last year. The reported PAD figure includes exceptional gain of Rs. 1.22 crores on account of reprocessing of raw material damaged in the Mahad floods last year. is converted into finished goods and the corresponding profits were taken in this quarter. The quarter one FY22 reported PAD also included a reversal of additional tax provision aggregating to rupees 64.5 crore consequent to a ITAC order in the company's favor. So the adjusted for these one-offs, the quarter one FY23 PAD stood at 22.3 crores against a PAD of 16.9 crores in quarter one FY22. On a consolidated balance sheet perspective, a current debt position, current net debt position stood at rupees 469 crore as on June 30th, 2022, against 509 crore as on March 31st, 2022. The decrease in debt was primarily on account of healthy cash flow generation during the quarter. In the next quarter, we would see some increase on debt on account payment of the second tranche of Holland Aromatics 19% stake and the balanced 30% acquisition of Nova uh, fragrances in Italy. 
from the medium term perspective we remain on reducing our total debt levels from next quarter onwards post the uh, acquisitions of these two stake of roughly 50 crores on the business operations i am pleased to share that our participation in the rfp by a large global mnc is going very well in the quarter we have signed the agreement with them making us one of the few global fragrance and flavor companies to be in their core list suppliers this is a major milestone in our journey in our growth journey and we remain optimistic on the significant multi year business potential from this account currently our team is already working on several briefs and we expect business to build on this from this calendar year itself to conclude as we look ahead from a demand standpoint we are currently witnessing steady wins and in inquiries across customers in our emerging and european markets there are concerns with regard to the macros given the inflationary environment and accordingly we remain cautious however we have promising growth initiatives in place and from a longer term perspective we are confident that the industry growth levers and our robust business model should enable us to grow and help report healthy performance on that note i would now request the moderator to open the forum for any questions or suggestions that you may have thank you we will now begin the question and answer session any one who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touch tone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles the first question comes from the line of faisal hawa from hg hawa and co please go ahead development budget uh, in uh, in one year uh, and uh, sir what are what kind of efforts are we making to you know uh, penetrate the uh, you know uh, the the which are very much amenable to our products and uh, what is the uh, sales contributed by our top 3 products and our top 3 customers i <clears throat> so rava i we lost the question in between uh, you asked us about effort to penetrate the market to product i am assuming this is in allied lines or similar to our product so we are obviously expanding our product portfolio to newer customers and uh, newer opportunities in uh, the second part of the question was in relation to the top 3 customers and products our top 3 customers and products uh, contribute roughly about 10% of the overall Uh, revenue of the company so it's a very diversified portfolio of products and uh, customers on the fragrance side uh, we are catering to more than 4000 uh, large or medium smcg companies across the regions uh, so we have a, similarly on the flavor we have more than 200 uh, plus customers in the flavor portfolio so our concentration of customers is not very high and development budget and uh, you know what kind of revenue do you expect uh, new products to uh, contribute to our uh, uh, sales uh, in the next 2 uh, to 3 financial years i think uh, <clears throat> one important part of the business is is the business momentum as we are coming out of the two pandemic years a lot of the r&d was focused on uh, Uh, pandemic specific products and launches and uh, now the fmcg companies are, with the inflation are relooking at their strategy going forward in terms of new product launches uh, with that uh, we see that the the new wins in the pipeline with however they are uh, strong there will be some uh, sort of uh, gap between the time they are launched in the market uh, we do not know whether that is uh, one quarter or two quarters but we expect that the companies who have approved and the products are in the pipeline will uh, look at the overall market growth and dynamics before the products are launched so quantify that on a yearly basis may not be a very uh, accurate number but we have roughly 50 crores worth of annual potential products in uh, in the pipeline which are approved with var at various stages 
which is a good number and uh, in line with our expectations for uh, growth in the future in addition our uh, uh, our uh, targets on the global mnc account are uh, in addition to this 50 crores so we are expecting a good amount of conversion of projects in the next uh, couple of quarters and then uh, the growth momentum will resume Sir, assumption that we would be able to grow 15% CAGR in the next two to three years, uh, looking at the kind of uh, approvals that we have and you know the products that we are going to put into the market. So we are talking about 12% uh, CAGR on our uh, existing business across uh, the next two to three years. We are confident of uh, that uh, outlook. Thanks so well, sir. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question comes from the line of Madhav Martha from Infidelity International. Please go ahead. Excuse me, Fidelity. Um, uh, my, my question was that uh, basically, sir, if you could just talk us through this um, a global client RFP which we've been speaking about. Um, is it basically with one FMCG company or is it with like two, three companies with whom we're discussing for this RFP? And uh, basically what, what is the potential um, or the size that we're looking to target? Uh, and what, when you think that the order book is going to build up uh, during CY22, basically do, do the revenues also start this year or it could be like next year? If you could give some sense, that would be helpful. So the RFP process has uh, multiple parts. Uh, we have not even completed the entire tendering process. So one part of the tender is still uh, uh, tendering process is still going on. On the other part, uh, the tendering process is completed. We have been assigned certain projects. We anticipate uh, these projects to start to actually see the sort of uh, product testing in the consumer phase. Uh, starting in the second half calendar and uh, then thereafter from first quarter calendar last quarter this year some uh, revenues are expected from this RFP. Uh, we are uh, very confident on, on the uh, submissions and the work that we are undertaking for these projects. Uh, in addition, uh, we have multiple other uh, global MNC clients where we are, our engagement levels have substantially increased in the last one year. Uh, so overall, we remain confident to break into the global uh, MNC accounts uh, as, as we have been uh, working with the regionals. Uh, in the same manner, we expect that the uh, next uh, phase of growth will come from the uh, global accounts in the Asian region. And we continue to work with the small and medium accounts in the European and newer geographies. Got it, got it. And um, when they say that, you know, we, we've got engagement with these clients which are scaling up in the last one year. Uh, and also, you know, I think we've been trying to break into these large MNC accounts for some years, but now we are seeing good traction. Is there something which is changing on the macro side which is helping us um, get better sort of foot in the door with these customers? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, this we have, like you mentioned, for the last past decade, we have always been knocking on the doors and it was. Uh, at finalization stage or at various stages but never converted into a final uh, brief and product development uh, engagement. Uh, I think a number of uh, factors are contributing to this as we go forward. Asia is uh, becoming an important market of growth for the uh, global uh, FMCG market. Uh, the shift of the kind of epicenter of growth from uh, China into Southeast Asia and South Asia uh, regions. So that is uh, expected that the larger part of the FMCG growth will be in the markets where we are traditionally present and where we have good presence and understanding. The second uh, impact of the pandemic has been disruptions in supply chain. So there is a heightened uh, move by most global companies uh, to have more regional or more local uh, sourcing. To that extent, uh, we offer a very good uh, alternative uh, 
regional supplier to the local MNCs. So I think these are the two trends which are uh, helping, uh, or which has uh, enabled uh, that now we finally are in the uh, operating side of the uh, product development. And uh, this business is we're talking about um, that supplies for Asia market only, right? Like it's an MNC client that supplies for their India, uh, sorry, Asia business. Or the Asia oh, so market. the business uh, tender and work, work we are doing is on the global basis. Okay. Uh, obviously, there are different brands which have different uh, sales in different countries. So uh, we, uh, within the entire 1 billion, we are seeing little bit more focus on the Asia uh, brands. So brands which are larger in the Asian countries are where uh, our engagement has begun. Uh, the uh, brief is open for global, so we will engage as, as things progress uh, to other regions as well. Hello. Hello. Madhav, you are still there? Hello. Mr. Madhav? Mr. Madhav, there is uh, some disturbance going on with your line. Mr. Madhav? Yeah, we can move on? Yes, uh, not a problem. We'll take the next participant, but before that, an announcement, uh, a reminder to all the participants to press star and one to ask a question. Next question comes from the line of Chirag from Keynote Capitals. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. So earlier, we used to give a geographical bifurcation uh, of revenue from fragrances and flavors separately. Uh, could you please help me out with that number? Sorry, geographical bifurcation of fragrance and of flavor. revenue, uh, uh, fragrance just and to, <coughs> to uh, update, we used to give uh, domestic and export uh, fragrance and flavors as uh, our uh, geography. With the acquisitions in Europe, we are now uh, moving into, uh, because there is some business cross uh, production, we are looking at the uh, uh, sort of three geographies, uh, emerging markets, uh, Europe and rest of the world uh, in terms of uh, the revenue. And we have the uh, similar bifurcation for the flavor, uh, uh, flavor as well. So the revenue, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you want the exact number for quarter uh, 123. The revenue for fragrances in India is 196. Uh, Europe is 103 and rest of the world is 59 and on the flavor the revenue is uh, 34 for India and rest of the world is 19. Uh, so my next question is uh, what kind of stable margins can we expect in fragrance and flavor business? I think we are uh, today at a EBITDA level of 13.5% uh, ballpark. Uh, we anticipate that we will keep this and uh, going forward there may be slight improvement as growth kicks in. Uh, I am sort of optimistic that uh, we have beyond the worst phase in the inflation of raw material. So the raw material prices should start to stabilize. That will help us somewhat to reduce our inventory and further improve the PAT levels. Uh, in addition, uh, just one sort of uh, black swan event in scenario if they, there is a raw material price crash, it might have an impact on a uh, few of our ingredient sales uh, in terms of the realized revenue. But uh, in terms of the uh, profit margin, that will remain uh, intact. Okay. Uh, so my last question is, uh, what kind of uh, the growth that you have uh, said that around 12% is that you would be able to grow for the next couple of years? Is it based on constant currency or is it is it based on the something else? Yeah, it's based on constant okay. currency. So okay. Okay. that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
A reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Once again, a reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question comes from the line of Ganesh Shetty, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir, and congratulations for a good set of numbers and tight macroeconomic challenges. Uh, sir, I just want to have some clarity on our uh, debt. That uh, last quarter to last quarter, we had uh, increased the uh, number of debt. And now this quarter, we had uh, reasonably uh, paid off some amount of debt. And going forward, uh, are we going to go on acquisition and try to uh, do leverage or balance sheet? Any thought on this? Any please uh, share it with us. Sir. Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we have ballpark uh, after currency conversion the exact number, but about 50 crores of payments towards the balance acquisition of Holland Aromatics and Nova, which is scheduled for this quarter. This is the second tranche of the uh, acquisition. So that 50 crore outlay is our uh, outlay for this quarter. Apart from that, we have no major uh, large uh, capex or uh, any other uh, large ticket uh, expenses. So we are uh, anticipating that we will progressively bring down the debt from uh, current levels uh, by end of the year to ballpark number 400 crores. Uh, so this is uh, the target. The next three quarters, we will look to uh, reduce the debt in, uh, you know, use the operating cash flows to continually reduce the debt. Yeah. Uh, sir, as far as the maximum challenges are concerned, the last two quarters have been very tough for us. There was a lot of uh, pressure, also there was a lot of pressure. And uh, are you facing any type of attrition related problem in our industry? Or uh, is there uh, some normal here as far as logistics is concerned? Can you please throw some light on I think the question was not very clear. Mm -hmm. I will answer. If I have missed the point, please re question. Uh, in terms of supply chain, I think we have had yeah. a pretty standard uh, after the first uh, lockdown in 2019, we were able to make all our factories uh, COVID ready and continue our operations uninterrupted throughout this period. Many of our products go to essential commodities like soap detergent and others, so we were uh, uh, requested to be continuing production throughout this period. Uh, as far as supply chain, uh, there is no specific disruption on the horizon at the moment. We see that the supplies from China last quarter were a bit affected, but now as we speak, uh, things are coming on stream and uh, we are seeing uh, material availability starting to come in. Uh, related to that, I had asked uh, one more question regarding attrition and employee costs. Is there any pressure from that end? As uh, everywhere this present, this problem is arising as a new. Uh, so we are we are uh, managing to control our employee cost to, within uh, within a band of acceptable levels. Uh, two years ago we did uh, or three years ago we did uh, reduce our R and D expenditure, uh, and now correspondingly employee cost came down to some extent. Uh, at this point, we are in, in control of the uh, overall scenario, and there is no specific uh, program or specific plan except to continue steady state, bring down the debt. Uh, as our engagement with the global MNCs increases, there may be some uh, one-off uh, costs on development and engagement with them, uh, which we are confident will result in uh, business revenue over the next uh, three, four years and offset the additional costs. Thanks a lot, sir. That's all from. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Anurag Patil from Roha Asset Managers. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Sir, from this global FRP, what sort of revenues we can expect in FY24 and 25? Any ballpark idea you can give? 
So as, as we've talked earlier, the entire RFP is about $1 billion to be issued out within uh, sort of two to three years. Um, realistically, we expect that roughly 10% of that is something where uh, we will be participating in the entirety. And out of that uh, 100 million odd is the total potential. There will be uh, two, three uh, other companies and uh, existing uh, suppliers. So uh, that's that's the sort of maximum potential is 100 million over three years, and uh, we expect to get our share through through that 100 million uh, uh, you know, any uh, anywhere uh, between 20 to 30 percent of that share is uh, a good ballpark target if we do reasonably well. If we are taking more than 30 percent share, it's uh, it's possible, but we are. Uh, participating for the first time, I want to be cautious and I, I think 20% of the share is uh, something which we will target in our first uh, RFP. Okay. And sir, in our European businesses, uh, what percentage of revenue should be from essential product categories? Very rough idea will be fine. Yeah, so in the European business, I do not have that specific uh, number. Uh, it would be in excess of 65%. I don't have an exact number. More than two-thirds of our business is going in home care, detergent, and uh, functional product. Uh, the balance, 30, I, am, I mean, it's in various products, so it's difficult to quantify essential or unessential. But in terms of cleaning, home care, uh, detergent, fabric, uh, these categories are two-thirds of our business in Europe. Okay, so demand-wise, uh, we are expecting stable scenario in the next couple of quarters. Yes, so our uh, business in Europe uh, is not very much dependent on it. So it's not very uh, uh, very dependent on fine fragrances or discretionary spend. Uh, we okay. we have various trends. So within the business, we have certain large brand business and certain private label or uh, local brand business, and we see that during the time of Fast growth, the large brand business grows faster, and during the time of recession, the mid or private label business grows faster. Um, having said that, uh, we have the uh, additional impact of inflation in Europe, particularly in Italy, because there is a very big sentiment on the uh, Russian gas uh, costs and uh, whether it will be available, and this uncertainty is reducing the consumer spending to some extent. Um, while Northern Europe, Netherlands side, we see less impact of this uh, phenomenon. In Italy, there is clearly a, it's an important factor. Um, we don't really uh, have too much past experience to judge how much it will affect us. But principally, uh, we don't see any of our businesses being uh, kind of stopping completely or starting with a big boom because of external. They are all essential commodities. And the, the growth rates may be a little less or more based on the macroeconomic and inflation and general uncertainty of consumer spending. Okay. And one last question. Uh, on the raw material basket, uh, are we already witnessing reduction in the prices or it is still at the elevated level? So they are not, uh, I would say at the full basket level, we are not seeing reduction as of now. We are seeing some uh, stabilization. So there was additional expectation of further inflation due to the uh, Ukraine situation uh, that is not happening at the moment. We see the same elevated prices, but no further, uh, further aggravation of that. Uh, some impact, small impact of the currency, uh, which uh, may come in uh, in the later part. Right now we are hedged and we have the raw material stocks. But if there is a very big movement on the uh, currencies, like in uh, US dollar, rupee, or euro, US dollar, there may be a small impact on the costs. But as of now, uh, we see that the overall impact of inflation in our basket this quarter versus last quarter and the expected uh, second quarter, uh, uh, it is flat. In the first quarter, we are not seeing additional inflation. Okay. That's it from my side, sir. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Next question comes from the line of E.L. Lad from Progressive Shares. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, sir. This is Pail here. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, well, I need a few clarifications uh, from the annual report, if you could just highlight on the same. <clears throat> Firstly, uh, there has been a mention in the AI that you are trying to focus more on the QSR space with uh, via the new taste acquisition. So, how is the demand, and how big is the opportunity size that the company is eyeing at? Uh, the QSR business is uh, basically the opportunity size is very large. It's about 2,000 crores of uh, flavor and uh, savory products going to QSR. With this new food acquisition, we are now starting to uh, target part of that, in especially the syrup, sauces, uh, seasonings kind of uh, product. And uh, we have doubled almost the revenue in this vis-a-vis -vis the last uh, couple of years of this acquisition. Although last year was a pandemic affected uh, year, or the last two years are not exactly the underlying uh, base. There is a very large, uh, you know, future demand. So the expected market uh, size for this QSR uh, product range is. Uh, all park estimated to be 2,000 crores across the country. Uh, we are taking a certain small niche size of that. So we are uh, looking at a 200 crore potential market right away for us to grow from the uh, uh, base of 12 crores and we continue to grow that part. Okay, okay. And uh, how is the traction seen in the Ayush, Ayush business? Like how is it favoring SHK? So as, as I mentioned, uh, I think the Ayush business has two parts. One is a combination sales with fragrances. So Ayurvedic extracts uh, going together with our uh, fragrance uh, offerings. So that has seen good traction. We have some very nice uh, products launched in the last uh, six months, which have both fragrance as well as active ingredients from the company. Uh, so this is a good uh, synergy. But the Ayurvedic extract part of the business itself in terms of value remains small because they are added in very uh, small quantity. They are, they are not uh, the major product. So uh, the volume of that is very small, but it is helping us to crack and develop uh, new innovative solutions for our clients. Okay. And... Uh... There, there was a mention like in a couple of uh, two quarters as well, like, you know, Q121 PAT had seen a reversal of additional tax provision uh, pertaining to previous assessment years and also reversal and disposal of assets. So are these provision and reversals a thing of the past or anything is left to be undertaken yet? No, these are uh, actually uh, the reversals and these are all one-offs. There is nothing left to be taken. We had the... Uh, uh, capital work in progress, particularly on the research, and uh, unfortunately in the two pandemic years, a lot of the projects got delayed. So as a result, we have uh, written it off, and we are now expensing all our development costs rather than taking to the uh, uh, CWIP. So they, they, it doesn't really uh, change anything uh, going forward. Okay, okay. And so one last question. You have been mentioning about undertaking calibrated price hikes. So we would just like to understand, like, what exactly is the structure or the policy at the company level? Like, how does it happen? The frequency of the same? So normally, uh, frequency of uh, our price hikes would have been uh, sort of 12 months annually discussion with the client. Um, with the extreme uh, inflation scenario we have seen in the last 12 months, we've had to do two times uh, engagement with the client on the price increase. And uh, that's that kind of, uh, we expect as a normal practice an annual discussion on, uh, on setting, resetting the prices. But this time around we've done uh, two times in the last 12 months. and. Uh, with the prices stabilizing, I think hopefully we get a good uh, 12 to 18 months of uh, stable pricing. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. That's it. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Rajesh Jain 
from NB Investments. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, I had two questions. The first is regarding the RFQ of the global MNC. Uh, you had mentioned around you know 100 million uh, you know dollars over a period of three years. So it is not annual. It is over a period of three years. Is that understanding is correct? So it is the annual potential of the business but it will not be all issued out at one go. So the potential annual business is 100 million. So 300 million worth of business will be uh, uh, tender. Okay. So now you also mentioned that, you know, you are expecting minimum 20% of that uh, business. Uh, based on the way, uh, the speed at which they are processing and all that, can we expect some sales in the current year or will it go to the next financial year? I think the... Uh, it's it's a question of uh, you know uh, timing it's difficult to a certain exact time but we are confident of some business uh, additional business coming by quarter four this financial at okay. least second half of this year and uh, next couple of years that business will continue to ramp up as uh, projects get completed so you mean to say maybe by FI25 we may get the FI24 we may get around you know whatever the share of business we get we will be able to do that in the full year financial year. Yes, so this uh, 100 million odd business will be split into projects. Wherever we win, we will start to supply for three to four years horizon on that product. So it will keep adding, and uh, as the uh, the cycle of this first cycle completes. The next cycle of product development and tenders will start. So it's a continuous. It's not that one happens and it stops at some point. Now we are on this. In the next three years there will be product development happening, and parallelly sales will follow uh, with a lag of say six to uh, say nine months to twelve months. Sir, once you get an opportunity to develop a product, uh, does it mean that you will also get an opportunity to supply also? Uh, yes. So the, the steps are the selection of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say white-listed or approved vendors. So we are now qualified vendors. Now okay. between the qualified vendors, there will be, a, 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 I would say, tender or bidding competition or design competition for the various brands at the sub-level within the tender. So that work has now started and we expect roughly Potential annual 100 million is the uh, kitty of projects that we will undertake, and 20% of that is our uh, good uh, starting point. We are in 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 this uh, for the first time, so we are hopeful to look at 20% win ratio or win rate as a good target, and uh, yeah, then this uh, process will continue. I mean, it's not that there is an end to this process in one year or two years. We've entered, this process will run for the next two to three years. Uh, ideally, uh, by the time this first wave and these tenders uh, start to complete, we will have three years of supply time. And by that time, the next wave will start. So there will be an overlap and uh, it, it should not be like, it will not end at some point. It should, we expect to be in this on a continuous basis. So you mean to say after two years, if let us say you win 20% of this 100 million, uh, and if any new products or new tender also you, that would be in addition to this 20% uh, of what we have won now. That's what you're saying, correct? So let's assume we have won uh, 50 crore business. This 50 crore business will remain for the next three years. That's the project cycle. Okay. Uh, and other projects we will keep working. So this 50 is in the supply and there will be another 50 which happens in the new development. So not everything will start on the same day and end on the same day. So there will be an overlap. In the two years period, we will have our maximum on this RFP. By the end of the third year, the RFP of the first year would have completed and the new tenders will start to come in. So I don't expect this to be ending like a sharp end. It will progressively go up and then there will be a steady state where we are working on projects, uh, new projects, and uh, then the win ratios uh, will determine if our business continues to grow and how what pace it grows. So on a starting base of very small, we expect it to grow to a steady state and uh, expect it to be around $20 million. Uh, dollars.
Okay. But I think you had mentioned uh, this would be a very low margin business. Is that understanding is correct? Uh, so typically, uh, in terms of the volume and gross margin, so if, even in our current business, we have the larger clients are at a lower gross margin okay. level. But okay. the operating cost per kilo for the manufacturing are also proportionately lower. So the net margin level is not very different between the small clients and the big clients. Okay. And okay. in this case, uh, depending on the product, uh, we expect that the gross margin will be on the lower side, but our net operating cost per kilo uh, also will be much lower than our current uh, size and scale uh, of operation, which will enable us to maintain the net margin. Okay, but this winning of any orders from this MNC will open a gate for the opportunity with other big MNCs. Is that understanding is correct? Absolutely right. But tell me, we have been acquiring a lot of European uh, F&F companies. Is that is not sufficient to go and approach the other M global MNCs uh, for us? Um, so yes, it is part of the strategy. Now, it's, there are so many factors. It's not just uh, one factor that you have European presence or not present. So there are so many factors in their decision making. But certainly the acquisitions in Europe and having the presence and development centers on different parts of the globe have helped us uh, take this additional uh, global MNC contract. So my second question is regarding the margins. Uh, if you see Q1 margins have been lower than the Q4 of our last financial year. So my first question is, you said there is no in increase in the raw material prices. So then why is that our, the, the EBITDA margins are down in Q1 of this financial year compared to last quarter? of last financial year. So uh, I am referring to additional increase in this quarter versus last quarter. Because we have almost two and two and a half, three months of stock, our price increase impact in the accounts happens uh, in the quart next quarter. So price increases happened in the first quarter uh, uh, calendar and second half of last year. The full impact of that is seen in the first quarter of this year. Okay, but uh, now now that there is no more further increase in inflation, and by the end of this quarter one, you would have exhausted the earlier uh, you know, high-priced inventory. Uh, what I want to know is, have we passed on all the you know increase in the cost of raw materials or the freight cost or whatever increases were there? Have uh, are we in a position to pass on all that to our customers? So uh, I think we have passed on a reasonable amount. Uh, we are not in a position to pass on entire amount. That's why our gross margins from uh, 43, 44 are now at 39, 40. We are not in a position to pass on entire cost increases to our clients in a short time. Okay. Uh, we anticipate as growth kicks in, uh, I mean, at some point in the uh, few years down the line midterm uh, basis, we will slowly uh, be able to improve our margins. But uh, at the moment, I think the 39-40% margin is the level at which we will continue to operate. Okay. Assuming that this, uh, there will be no increase uh, in the raw material prices, uh, we had done in FI21 around 45% of gross margin. Uh, to reach that level, how many more years we do require? It's a very uh, difficult question given the uncertainties. Um, I think the question really is a uh, uh, question of what is the growth strategy and what is the margin strategy. So we are focusing on growth at, at this sort of uh, gross margin level. We could move uh, the needle and say, okay, if we are looking at more global MNC business and the gross margin will be lower, the growth rate will be higher. Uh, net margin level, pack percentage level, things will even out. And uh, at some point, we may have to take a strategy to say, okay, we are, uh, you know, kind of looking at slower growth, but we need to increase uh, margin, uh, gross margin in the product mix. So this, uh, this is always a kind of a balancing act. So we are sort of looking at now a 40% gross margin, 12% CAGR growth as our baseline. Uh, okay. If there is uh, challenges on growth because of macro or other uh, things, then we will relook at this. But right now we are uh, 
talking about this uh, trend line if uh, for example prices start to soften maybe uh, it can happen uh, in one year that our margin side in if you go back in force major scenario 2018-19 and couple of years we were able to jump back to 44 percent so it's all uh, market dynamic supply chain uh, supply demand and uh, inflation rate and growth rate but our objective will be to restore back to 44-45 percent we see that as a long term uh, target for our gross margin expectation. Okay, sir. And my last question is: We have done a lot of acquisition both in India as well as Europe. But in one of the AGM, you had mentioned if we want to achieve our vision of uh, you know reaching one billion of sales, we need to have presence in America, which is you know which is a bigger market for F and F. Uh, keeping that in mind. Just wanted to know, uh, do you have any companies or anything in mind, you know, to acquire it uh, in USA? So, like I mentioned, we are not actively looking at any uh, specific uh, acquisition. Uh, you mentioned America. Yes, that's, uh, you know, 30% plus of the global market is in one country and uh, it's important. We will uh, need to look at... Uh, managing our debt level and the uh, uh, kind of stabilizing the current business before we do any uh, large uh, uh, next step acquisition. So uh, as a springboard to the uh, American business, we need to stabilize our European business, which then the need further, and then we will go from Europe to America in uh, stage two. Uh, but in in that uh, we are also looking at uh, so with this global MNC project we may have some activity in uh, America linked to their projects so we are observing or looking at that uh, but there is no immediate plan of any big investment in uh, in America. Okay, but if we want to achieve our vision, is it necessary that we have to have our presence in America? I think the long and short answer of that is yes because uh, in relation to the global business uh, the america north america particularly is uh, almost 30 percent of the global business okay. so it is important that we at least have a presence in uh, you know two out of the three big markets china uh, europe and america europe we are already working the growth in southeast asia in south asia in africa but on a short term, in the next 10 years, uh, uh, to really take aggressive uh, growth, we will need to have a presence in the U.S. as well. Okay. Thank you very much and wish you all the best. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Abbas Petia from Inam AMC. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Just wanted to understand this 12% CAGR target. Does that include this RFP wins or that is separate? Uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, there is a uh, overlap. I don't think the 12% CAGR is uh, based on the RFP. It is an organic target for us uh, in total. However, with this RFP, we are also utilizing some of our development and sales resources in this uh, uh, in this uh, target. So we we see that. But in in a steady state uh, scenario, our 12% ambition is without the global RFP. So the global RFP should be in addition uh, for the first. Uh, I mean, I would say two, three quarters, four quarters. We will have to. Uh, make uh, double use of the development resources and uh, yeah so 12 percent CAGR is not with uh, calculating the rfp into the uh, account on a longer term but how much sales will be overlap initially say in 2024 first year uh, it's not so much the sales it's the opportunity so we may have to uh, not do some projects in the current customer base. Uh, we may have to be a little bit selective on the projects and uh, adjust our uh, approach with the global RFP for a year or I would say 18 next 18 months. Uh, so I, I mean, if I have to put a number, maybe for one year we will be 9% in our current uh, 
current business and 3% in RFP and the year after that will be 12% and additional top up uh, 1-2% from the RFP. So something like this, uh, I mean it's very difficult to quantify. Our objective is to make sure we put the full, full resources on this RFP opportunity which is a big opportunity for us. And, and it is about you know the effort and return metrics which we have to follow and at some point in time we have to cut the tail to achieve a larger objective. Okay, and you also said that margins will be similar, so this on a gross margin it will be lower, but on a operating margin it will be 14 or 15 or percent, the RFP margins? Yes, there is no impact at the operating level uh, with the large business uh, or large products or the small products. In the gross margin level, there is a, it's a product mix uh, scenario. Okay, and how this RFP works after three years, the initial sales kind of die down and you have to bid again, or is it that that continues and... Then, no, it, after three years, typically there is a second bidding process. Okay, but does that mean that your chances of winning the next bid is higher because you've already supplied, or is it, is it a fresh process, different product? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously our chances, if we are doing well in this RFP, the chances are better. That's, that's clear. Because yeah. today we are acting as a challenger. If we work for three years, then, you know, we are we will be one of the key suppliers and uh, we won't be a challenger anymore. Okay. Thanks. That's all from my side. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Sachin Kasera from Swan Investments. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, just uh, want to come clarity on this gross margin thing. So you said that you have taken a stand that because you want to grow faster, it helps you. Have... Sorry, uh, Sachin, if you cannot be able to hear, it was not clear. Is it better, sir? Yeah. Yeah. That it has gone from 44 to 13, and you also mentioned one of the previous queries that uh, uh, because of the sharp increase in raw material, we cannot frequently to the uh, customers and ask for a price again. Now that the price has stabilized, uh, so I am a little confused that you know. But you also mentioned that we may not be able to grow margin significantly in the short term. So it's a little confusing. Because if we are saying that all of the price is stabilized and you know we should be able to get a price hike, at the same point of time, you are saying in the short term uh, the margins will not improve, but the long term aspiration remains 40. Uh, it's a little confusing. The price hikes have happened in the past. We won't be able to get additional price hikes as the raw material price is remaining stable and our selling price is remaining stable. Our margins will remain stable. There is no further impact of additional inflation or additional pricing. So it will be steady state going forward next quarter. We don't anticipate any price increase and we don't anticipate any raw material increase either. Now uh, if the raw materials start to uh, fall, uh, at that time we will uh, we will be able to uh, you know negotiate with the clients accordingly. And you know the the, the way we have managed. Uh, 39-40% gross margin is through our student inventory policy. That has also helped us. Now, in times when we see that the prices are stabilizing or it is going to soften, we will play it accordingly and that will further, you know, help us. No, but sir, I don't understand in the business model. Do you know, understand the way it works is that in the short term, the price fluctuations are absorbed by the supplier. And eventually, over a few quarters, once the raw prices price is stabilized, the gross margins go back to the previous level. So I'm still not able to reconcile. Is it that the uh, our customers are asking us to take a 4% price hike on a structural basis to remain in the business with them, which it does no, is so, well. uh, just understand the dynamics of this. So we have had a 25% ballpark uh, uh, cost increase. We are not in a position to pass on anything like 25% on our product mix within uh, three to six months period. So we have taken a hit of roughly 10% on the gross margin side at, at our end. Right now the costs are where they are, selling prices are where they are. So our effective gross margin of around 40% uh, will be the uh, paradigm for the next two quarters 
we have the material stock and the sales contracts and prices accordingly as the raw material prices were to further increase we will obviously be forced to give additional price increases to our clients which we will do but if the prices were to soften then uh, we will uh, again uh, look at uh, readjusting the prices if there is a big change so i i don't see any uh, anything we are now in a stable state at 40% unless there is a huge uh, sort of growth spurt and uh, big dynamic change in the market uh, we anticipate 40% to be the new norm for the next 6 to 9 months um, it's it's anybody's guess but if uh, let's say there was a big recession and big challenge on the growth and the raw material prices fell maybe the margins are better the growth challenges will be there right now 40% margin 12% growth is what we see if the growth is is remaining like this we don't see how the uh, uh, cost prices will uh, dramatically change sure well understood sir but then can you then explain how do we reach back to because you said the long term goal remains 44% so uh, while you have explained very well that in the next 6 to 9 months why it will remain 40% but then how this how things will change which will take us to 44 say over next 3 to 4 years which is more like a long term aspiration of the company yeah so i, I think there is uh, obviously steps on the backward integration on our costs uh, which we will keep taking and improving so there there is ballpark half percent to 1% of uh, <coughs> raw material price improvements which we do with our uh, research on the chemical or raw material side or vendor development side Uh, all those things are not seen because of this major inflation at this point and uh, as the inflation stops those initiatives will start to help us drive better uh, margins so fair to assume that we should see some improvement say in financial year 24 and major improvement in fy 25 on this uh, long term journey of gross uh, margin improvement is i i think as we speak now yes there are some other new factors which happen during sure. the next i i want to caution that the uncertainty in all the forecasts are now very high but uh, if there is no additional uh, you know big disruption global disruption then in two years time things will stabilize our margins will slightly get better and, uh, and that will be uh, i think again it's a product mix scenario if our global mnc if rfc was becomes a bigger part of our business then our overall gross margin while they are lower our operating margin will uh, improve yeah so that was my next question so so with all these initiatives from a little long term say f25 f26 perspective as in we also win this uh, global tender which we are very hopeful of then how should we look at the ebitda margin because see our highest range has been 18 to 20% on the lower end we are between 12 13% is it that in 3 4 years uh, with all the initiatives you are talking on the gross margin as well as this new tender and the growth and operating leverage can we aspire to become a 17% margin or that was like a one off and sustainable number in the like even from a 5 year perspective like more like 15% what is your take on that yeah so I, you have basically answered the question in your, in the question itself i think on the lowest end we are at the 14% ebitda level which is right now and i think that that's the lower end of the range uh, we aspire to be a 20% ebitda uh, business uh, we've done 18 we have done 16 uh, we are at at quarters we have done 13 and a half uh, so the uh, i think the average range now with the new inflation adjusted basis is more or less 16 and a half uh, if inflation were to kind of convert into deflation maybe that can go up but uh, the kind of i would say 18% median is now 16 and a half percent median in terms of ebitda percentage and uh, as we go our margin uh, stabilizes improves our ebitda percentage should reach that kind of level Sure. And sir, lastly, on the debt thing, you mentioned in figure right that you looked the debt to be around 400 by end of the year. Sorry, Sachin, uh, we lost you there. Yeah, I'm saying did I hear it correct in the call? You mentioned that you expect the net debt to be 400 crores by end of March FY23. Is that correct? Uh, so basically, uh, net debt in this quarter will go up because of the 50 crore second tranches. So it's not that in uh, September end quarter the debt will come down. Uh, 
uh, I am talking about 400 directionally. I think uh, we uh, also need to be mindful of what is the uh, raw material situation. So I expect somewhat cooling off of the raw material and uh, reaching the 400 target. Raw material prices remain where they are. Maybe we reach 425 uh, at the end of March. Now, uh, these are the operating level numbers. Depending on interim dividend or uh, any other payouts, then uh, that's, that's kind of... Uh, so, I expect to be between 400 and 425 by end of March as of the cash flow from the business. There will be some interim dividend or if we don't do any interim dividend, what are the cash outflow to the shareholders are not uh, factored in this, uh, at this point. Sure. And so just for last question on capital allocation, so you know we did one round of buyback and we are very confident on growth and margin coming back. So uh, do you think that you expect to do maybe another buyback at this time from the open market because since then there's been further price correction, whereas our overall outlook at growth, growth aspirations have changed. So once in the next two, three quarters that comes down further, we would seriously evaluate looking at our buyback, uh, you know, because current valuations are uh, very, very low. So we are uh, looking at buyback and dividend as two methods for cash uh, distribution or profit distribution to the shareholders. We have a policy of 30 to 40 percent of back to be distributed to the shareholders. We will follow that consistently. Uh, the modality of whether we do buyback or dividend depends on the situation at the time. And uh, we will consider uh, various options. At, uh, at the moment, uh, there is no... Uh, cash distribution or profit distribution to the shareholders in the plan for the next two, three quarters. Uh, we are focused on operations, uh, getting the growth and reducing the debt. And once that happens, uh, we will, you know, we will evaluate the best form of uh, distribution of profit to the shareholders at that relevant time, taking into account the conditions at that time. And just lastly, again on this debt thing, so uh, what level of absolute debt or debt to EBITDA or net debt to equity is where we may again start to evaluate or, you know, if any good equation comes, we look uh, very, uh, you know, seriously. I think right now the priority is to bring the debt down, but is it like some number like say 400 crores or 300 crores or say three times debt to EBITDA, what level is when we may again start to look uh, good good equation opportunities? You see, the... The acquisition and strategic discussions are not uh, not not timed, right? It is it happens there can be a very big market dynamic, some merger, some uh, fallout, some uh, you know some distress sell by somebody. A uh, lot of uh, lot of things can happen. So I I don't want to speculate on on that uh, in the future. As of now, we are not in any active uh, active proposal to acquire or invest additional monies. Our focus this year is on running what we have and bringing the debt down. Uh, yeah, that's that's the, I mean, we don't have any specific level above which we will start again an active acquisition process in mind. Uh, we will continue to evaluate any opportunities if they come, but we are not actively seeking. So there is some uh, opportunity work to come and uh, it, it makes real sense. We could look at it, but uh, as of now, I think the expectations in valuations and the uh, debt level where we are, I don't see any deals happening. Sure. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. As there are no further questions, we have reached the end of question and answer session. I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you. I hope we have been able to answer all of your questions satisfactorily. Should you need any further clarifications or would like to know more about the company, please feel free to contact us or our team or CDR India. Thank you once again for joining us on this call. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of SH Kilkar and Company Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your